Now, one would think that I typically enjoy going back and watching these shows from days of yore, from when wrestling was really, really good. Right? And, and in general, I do. But there's also an associated danger with going back in time for me and watching some of these old shows. Circa the Attitude Era. Is number one, you jerk holes are suggesting these shows because you want me to rant about a certain Memphis mid-card piece of crap. Well, thankfully, ain't on this one. So I'm safe there. The second piece is I know some of you sick, sadistic bastards strategically plan out the show ranges and time ranges, date ranges, year ranges of what you want to suggest to me. You should think I'm going to hear a certain song and a certain entrance for a certain character. I'll get to y'all soon enough. But let's go ahead and talk about WWF Armageddon 2000. A show full of great talents. A show full of matches where it seemed like most everything had some type of story associated with it. Everything seemed to have something going on. Everything seemed to have some extracurricular activities of some kind. A perfect example of a wrestling show that was perfectly suited for the time that it was in in 2000 that I don't think holds up as well watching it 20 years later, personally. Like, you start off with the six-person intergender elimination match. you got the Hardy Boys with Lita taking on the Radicals. Like, why, why are all the people, like, going back, I, I, I haven't even forgotten about this. Let's just be straight up. It's hard to track and remember every single damn storyline in human existence, all right? But I had totally forgotten about this crap with Dean Malenko and Lita and them feuding over the light heavyweight championship. Ugh. <laughs> Thank God we didn't have social media back then. We could contain this stupidity of the hardcore fans to certain chat rooms and wrestling forums because could you imagine if he was wrestling Lita back in 2000 then they were talking about how great this is for wrestling and all wrestlers and it puts ahead society 20 years to the curb because Dean Malenko is that awesome and we want to see him shove straight into the main event scene. It was a typical Attitude Era opening type of match. I don't know like Maybe around this time, Lita had a little bit of smashability to her. I just, I can't. I know some of y'all do. And some of y'all back in the day probably smashed yourself thinking about her. But I just don't know that it could have been me. A European Championship. William Regal defends against Hardcore Holly. This show is in Birmingham, Alabama. Birmingham, Alabama, as Mean Gene would say. And Regal's pre-match promo in the ring was just pure cheap heat gold. Just fantastic. That cheap heat stuff working to the local crowd works. It always will work. And I wish, frankly, more talents did it, especially if they did it right. Again, kind of standard few minutes here of action. You're not, I'm personally not expecting the best. You get some Raven interference. William Regal wins, and he retains his European Championship. I do miss the European Championship. Because while today's WWE product certainly does not need another belt, we used to have some really quality European champions and some really interesting European championship feuds. You most certainly did. Uh, China versus Val Venus. Like, hearing that right to censor music, man. Mm, 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 mm. When I think of right to censor, it comes across as kind of like it was playing it like a necessary evil, clean up some of these characters and gimmicks of the past now that the company had went public the year before. And Val Venus, and then the Godfather becomes the good father. He can't be publicly traded, be talking about hoes and everything else. So I certainly understood it. And Ivory kind of being the de facto female face of the group and Stevie Richards being the male face of the group, I thought actually worked. I will say this much about Ivory. She could absolutely 100% get it then in any gimmick, and I don't give it yet. She could still get it now. I don't care if she's close to 60. I'll knock the cobwebs off, cobwebs off of it. I don't care. And I know, fellas, white and black alike, I'm not alone. Y'all think, because I only date black women, that that means I would never do a white woman. And that is just simply not true. Because Ivory could fuck me up. Uh, China Val Venus, you know, solid match. 
you would sit there and say, like, these are two matches that featured intergender wrestling. You would think that I would hate it. These actual matches probably would hold up better now 20 years later because you have so much intergender wrestling going on in the independent circuit. Um, for me, like I said, I'm not huge on intergender wrestling. Uh, but in cases like Lita versus Dean Malenko, there was actually a story to it. So, And it was in a six-man tag, so that's not so bad. Um, and then the whole China Val Venus thing, like, China was a star. She was a big star. She had already done Playboy by this point in time. Like, she was a really big star. And let's try, not try to minimize her and pretend like she wasn't. She was. She absolutely was. So her star power kind of commanded her presence in this match. Um, it was part of a thing between her and Ivory. Um, it was okay. Last man standing match with Chris Jericho and Kane. It was really interesting they chose to have a last man standing match on this show in the middle of the card when you already had the sixth man Hell in a Cell match at the end of the night for the WWF Championship. Felt like maybe it was a little overkill. Um, but it was solid. It's certainly not going to be the best last man standing match you ever see. It feels like when you go back and think about this era and time of WWE, it's more kind of standard fare because you used to see stuff like this all the time. Now, does this match hold up? Eh, kind of. The barrels dropping on Kane finish, though, looked kind of dumb. You know, I understand it worked. I understand what it was designed to do. It was the only way you could have a Chris Jericho beat a Kane in a last man standing match. But, you know, it just... What didn't help was the hammer being out of position to where they actually showed when the barrels fell down that there was clear space between the barrels and Kane. At least the camera's got to move more behind Jericho and show, shoot the shot that way. So it looks like it may have actually legitimately fully came down on Kane. Uh, you had a Four Corners Tag Team Championship match. It was Edge and Christian, right to censor, in this case being the Good Father and Bull Buchanan, K-Quick, and Road Dog. Remember those guys were a team for a period of time? And the Dudley Boys. Well, yeah! Well, yeah! Remember how over that shit was? And these guys blatantly lifting and ripping off from the Budweiser commercials, sitting there... Holding Bubba Ray, holding somebody's legs wide open, and Devon's about to headbutt him in the nuts, and they're going, well, yeah. And then Devon goes, well, yeah. Like, people pop for that. Like, it's crazy how over something like that was. It was a solid four corner tag championship match. Edge and Christian won, seemed a little weird, but. You know, as we know, a few months later, you got to WrestleMania. All of a sudden, you're talking about it's a TLC match, and history was made. Intercontinental Championship match. For all the people that talk trash about Billy Gunn as a worker, like, there was an obvious talent there. He was six foot four, six foot five, had a good physique, had some personality, could talk a little. He wasn't like Rogue Dog charismatic, but he could get his point across. Uh, but this is a perfect example here of where this guy is a little bit underrated. Because they were trying to call him the one Billy Gunn, which is which feels like it was a bit of overkill. Uh, but he went in to this and defended his Intercontinental Championship against an invisible man. And not only did that, he dropped the title <laughs> to the invisible man. Yes, we're, we're going there. That's what it is. The invisible man. The invisible man. And even tapped out to the Invisible Man. Like, how dare you ever talk about badass Billy Gunn, the one Billy Gunn, and say that he couldn't work. Bullshit. At Armageddon 2000, he worked against nobody. And he made it work. You get what I'm saying? You feel me? Um, but at this point in time, even as I'm watching the show, I'm like, is it time to get to the six-man Hell in a Cell match or not? You had one more match, one more championship match before that main event. It was a women's championship. Holy shit. Molly Holly, Trish Stratus, and Ivory. Like, oh. God, you talk about going back to the days of 18, 19, 20-year-old Jeff and having the hots for all three of these ladies. Like, Molly Holly was beautiful. And that was with hair or with how. And if you don't like that... Thick ass ham booty, you got problems. And that's the type of booty that makes gay men go curious or maybe even straight. Unbelievable. And then Trish, what more do I have to say about that goddess back in 2000? Fantastic and magnificent. And Ivory, like, yeah, 
even though she was wearing the kind of prudish gear. Like, there was something about her, like, you want her to take you and, like, throw you down and, like, completely physically assault you and it's okay and you would brag about it. Like, you would encourage that type of behavior. Like, these were three talented women, three beautiful women. Match was very short. Finish kind of came out of nowhere and it was more about the APA appearing at the end, grant you, but there's a good reminder to me of, you know, how much more interesting the women were back then, how much better looking the women as a whole were back then. Sure, you had your freaks and your geeks and everything else, but man, you had some drop-dead stunners. Beautiful women. Beautiful women. And this was certainly three of them in that time. Good Christ almighty. But you put all that aside, let's be clear here. This show was ultimately about one match. And the company really, and the way they presented this, even on the Sunday Night Heat show before that, and leading up to it all throughout the night, they did a magnificent job of pacing the show out and really spreading out the touch points for this Hell in a Cell match. You got interviews from each of the six participants. So you got a glimpse into their character. Well, with Triple H and pre-boob job Steph, you got them backstage for a couple of minutes talking back and forth. But even then, Triple H is getting across that you're the boss's daughter and you're my wife, but all the while, damn it, this is the most important thing in my life. Like it was the intensity, the believability that you thought that that title and that level meant more to God than anything else. And it probably realistically did. Like everything about this just works so, so well in the way that they had each of these guys throughout the night. And especially a great use of Taker and Mick Foley and HBK and talking about the Hell in a Cell and what the Hell in a Cell has meant and showing video clips throughout the night, whether it be No Way Out 2000 with Triple H and Mankind or Triple H Cactus Jack and King of the Ring 98, Babylon 97, like you can go on and on and on. The point being is you had all of these different clips being shown throughout the night, all these different wrestlers talking about Hell in a Cell. And it was just magnificently done. The Vince McMahon stuff, you know, like on the one hand, it's kind of weird, but then again, it's, it's not really when you go back and look at the the scope of time, like it was an awkward seeing him walk around with the cane. Uh, but, you know, the whole concept of he's trying to protect his investments and thinks this is a stupid match, you can kind of get it. Even though, like, really, is that what a Mr. McMahon should really be worrying about? So it's kind of, eh. But I look at this match. I know a lot of people look back on this match as some great, epic, legendary, awesome, memorable thing. And it certainly had an awesome, legendary, memorable moment. You know, when you look at Rikishi getting choke slammed into the truck of hay, or what was it, the cedar chips or whatever the hell it was, when Taker choke slammed him, like, just think about what's, what's got to be going through Rikishi's mind as he's setting this up. Like, you're going out there working the whole time, knowing this spot is set up and your 400 plus pound fat ass is going to be falling from the top of the hill in a cell into that truck bed. Like, you got to be thinking about how you're going to land. You got to think about, you know, your direction, how perfectly you've got to be on the mark. Like, you're trusting Mark, you're trusting Taker to help guide you a little bit. Like, just imagine the thought process there of knowing that eventually is coming and you got to prepare yourself for it and do work an entire match with that on your mind. But it was typical 2000 attitude era type of crash TV. Vince coming out with the freaking construction truck. And he's trying to take off the freaking Hell in a Cell. He's trying to remove the Hell in a Cell. But all that happens is the freaking door rips off. So that way all the chaos and anarchy can spill outside of the cell. And now you got guys fighting up the ramp. And it was just too much going on in this match. Like admittedly, it was too much. I certainly understand the concept. But when you look at the, the guys, like you had five really big stars in Rikishi. I'm not even trying to slight Rikishi. Because they certainly tried. Like, they went with him. They tried, and it didn't work. Sometimes that happens. But, you know, even Rikishi in that time, before his heel turn, you know, he's a very popular character. He's very over, certainly a guy you can make some money with. Um, but it was too much. Like, whereas these guys had issues coming in, like Austin and Triple H, I really liked Austin's interview earlier in the show with JR, when he's talking about, you know, yeah, I've certainly got beef with Triple H. I want to get back at him and Rikishi as well, but that can't, help force me to take my off the prize, which is I want that WWF championship. I really like how well that was done. 
Uh, but, you know, it was really hard to track because you've got guys fighting everywhere. Like, when it's a triple threat, at least in a Hell in a Cell, you could potentially have one guy resting or hiding, and the other two are working, and you don't feel like you're missing much. It's just too much darting around and too much trying to keep up with everything that's happened. Because you've got three sets of guys basically fighting. Like, again, it sounds like something that sounds great on paper, but incredibly hard to execute. And while, like I said, there certainly were memorable spots in this match, you know, even kind of the finish was a little bit flat. And I don't even know if it's just that Kurt Angle pinned the rock in that way. It's just, you know, the fact that you had Triple H interfere with Austin, and then that's when Angle does the roll-up. And then after Angle gets awarded the title, then Austin comes in and hits a stunner. Yet all the while... When you think about what happened a few months later, by the time you got to WrestleMania 17, you know, it's not Taker versus Rikishi at Mania. It's Taker versus Triple H. It's not Stone Cold Steve Austin versus Kurt Angle for the WWF Championship. It's The Rock walking in as champion, defending against Stone Cold Steve Austin. Like, this show was kind of weird. It really was. They really changed course and trajectory in some ways in the next couple of months leading up to WrestleMania 17, but... Um, you know, it was certainly making a big statement at a time having Kurt Angle win a match like that, even in the way that he did. You know, damn, that was a guy, when you think about Kurt Angle, like, he had no business being as damn good as he was so early in his career. He had absolutely no business. You want to talk about one of the quickest studies, the quickest learns, the quickest, you know, that you introduce and he can actually carry as a top guy in wrestling history. He certainly is on that short list. But, I, like I said, this match... Going back, I've went back and watched this match several times over the years. This show from beginning to end, it probably has been close to 20 years since I've went back and watched it all. Um, you know, a long, long time ago, and I don't really recall ever watching this entire match again from or entire show from beginning to end. But I would go and I've checked out this match a few different times to remind myself of I really didn't like it 20 years ago. I didn't like it 10 years ago. I didn't like it that much five years ago. And honestly, I don't like it that much now. People remember it. It certainly is memorable. But memorable does not equal great. You get what I'm saying? Like, the gobbledygooker is memorable, but that doesn't make it great. It makes it epic in terms of the botch that it was and the hilarity and train wreck that it was. But... You remember it, but it's not great, like in terms of the definition of true greatness. Like if you were asking me, am I going to recommend this as a Hell in a Cell match to watch? No. If you have a curiosity about going back and watching it, sure, fine. You'll be plenty entertained enough, perhaps, to get through it. But, you know, when you're, you're stacking this up against even like Triple H and Cactus Jack in the way out 2000 or... You're measuring this up against Taker and Mankind at King of the Ring 98 or Taker HBK at Bad Blood 97. Like, this match just falls woefully short of each of those Hell in a Cell matches, and we've certainly seen better Hell in a Cell matches in recent years. So memorable, but not great. And a lot of people seemingly, as an association with that six-man Hell in a Cell WWF Championship match, view this as a memorable show, and for that match it probably is, but again, I certainly did not think this was a great show. Good? Easy to get through? Yes. Are there certainly a significant number of other shows from the Attitude Era that I would recommend over this one? Absolutely. freaking -lutely.